Okay, well, welcome to this session, which is all about management mental health training. And I'm not sure where everybody is, as I've just shared with Rachel. We've got about 18 people that have subscribed to this session. So if there are people that are joining, then I will look forward to seeing all of you when you get here. But the fact that we've even had 18 people subscribe to this session, for me, that really shows how important this topic of management mental health training is. And one of the reasons that I wanted to put on this free webinar is because from my observation, from having run management mental health training for so many years, is that when I get people, very experienced heads of HR, experienced learning and development professionals, well-being managers, come to us with the intention of organizing management mental health training, they're often really quite overwhelmed because mental health is such a big topic. So if they've been given the responsibility of organizing mental health and well-being training for managers, they often have a lot of questions about how much of the mental health spectrum that they need to cover, whether the training should be mandatory, whether it should be voluntary, whether we should do it online, whether we should do it face to face, whether the C-suite should be included, how long the training should be, what skills we need to give managers so that they can help to proactively manage mental health. So all of these questions can quite often lead to feelings of feeling a bit overwhelmed and feeling a bit lost about where to start when it comes to planning management mental health training. So I thought, okay, this is what I'm observing. So where can I be of service in helping people to make this experience an easier one because I totally understand that you want to get this right. And my background is itself human resources. And so I completely understand the need to want to make sure that the training is right, that it has the right impact and that it gives you the results that you're looking for. So, just to give you a little bit about my background, um, and I'm sorry if my voice sounds a bit croaky, I'm just coming through COVID. <coughs> but my background, I actually worked in HR for about 12 years. Uh, I was always very clear that I wanted to work in HR. I got my degree in HR, my CIPD, and I worked for a lot of very well-known brands like British Airways Holidays, Virgin Atlantic, did a little bit of work in the NHS, Carnival UK, Debenhams, when it was still very much in its heyday on the uh, high street. And I never had any intention of doing what I do now, but I think sometimes the universe works in mysterious ways. And I had an opportunity to learn solution-focused psychotherapy and hypnotherapy. And at the time I thought, wow, I don't really want to be a psychotherapist. I thought HR, uh, I thought hypnotherapy might be helpful in uh, hypnotizing people to sometimes do what I needed them to do as far as the workplace. But it struck me that so much of our HR training is very much based on policy and process. And it doesn't really give us a huge amount of insight into the human psyche. What is it that makes people behave the way that they do? What is it that potentially impacts us? What is it that makes people tick? And given that the world of human resources is very much founded in employee engagement, I just saw an opportunity that learning more about us as humans could actually contribute to my career in human resources. So I embarked on my professional training and I got about a third of the way into my training when I just spent a whole weekend diving deep into the neuroscience of stress when three things occurred to me. The first one was 
I realized that I'd spent most of my HR career living in the stress response and I didn't know it. The second was, why is this information not out there? And the third was just an overwhelming knowing that I had to take this information out into organizations. I could see that this was the, if you like, the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And so fast forward 12 years and I'm still here putting this information out into the world. And even though I think the whole topic of mental health has been very much at the forefront for so, so many years, there's still huge amounts of work that needs to be done to help educate people about the mind, about mental health, about what takes somebody from not being okay, uh, sorry, from being okay to not being okay. So with that in mind, I would really love to know, uh, I can see Agnes, you've joined us. I'd love to know what both of you would really value from the time that we have here today. So Rachel, what would you love to take away from today's session? So just on me, um, I think really just some, some some ideas about how we might plan this with our managers to, to, to be able to give them resources to help themselves but also recognize and help their teams um so i think that that would be really like a, a, almost a pathway as you say trying to navigate there is so much kind of trying to navigate something that that we could put in that's really practical and tangible yeah absolutely get it agnes welcome oh, i'm not sure if you can hear it me or whether you've got something going on with your microphone but either you can just pop it into the chat function what it is that you would really value from today's session marjorie can you hear us loud and clear Okay, we've maybe got some technical issues going on. So Marjorie and Agnes, welcome. Um, if you can, I'd love you to just pop into the chat function what would be of real value from you, from me, for you to gain from today. So where shall we start when it comes to management mental health training? Well, one of the places that I would always invite anybody when it comes to any form of training to start with is to begin with the end in mind. So I get a lot of inquiries from HR people, from wellbeing managers, from learning and development managers who are looking to invest in management mental health training. And as I say, they're often really quite overwhelmed about where to start. So a really simple place is to start with the end in mind, what it is that you're trying to achieve. What would let you know that the management mental health training had been a worthwhile investment of time, of energy, and of course, of your learning and development budget. So quite often the conversation is one where managers, um, HR managers or leaders might say, well, we want people to be able to spot the red flags, to have managers know what it is that they're looking for that lets them know that they need to initiate a conversation. What are the red flags that somebody's struggling with? And they're looking for some kind of tool um, that managers can be equipped with that can help them in having those conversations. And I say, great. But in doing that, in having your managers know what the red flags are and initiating those conversations, what will that give you that you don't otherwise have? So 
if we think about this from a really big picture perspective, if we think about the goals of your HR strategy, if we think about the goals of your organization, I would imagine that some of your goals, particularly in the world of HR, are going to be around culture, are going to be around talent management, are going to be around employee engagement. So thinking about those big picture goals, then for me, management mental health training isn't just about spotting the red flags and initiating conversations. It's thinking about what will that give you that you don't have. So a really simple example, I was working with somebody. So I still work with uh, one to one people um, on a private basis, and I have done for about 12 years. And in that 12 years, I've probably held around about 10,000 one-to-one sessions. So for me, this whole topic of management mental health training is something I'm even more passionate about because I've kind of got my foot still in the old HR camp, but I can really understand what's going on for people at a one-to-one level. And I worked with a woman who was um, the head of a department for one of the big banks who'd been struggling for about six months with anxiety. And she had a very senior role. She had a lot of uh, responsibility within the organization. And her director had never once initiated a conversation, even though she said she knew that her performance was going downhill and it was going downhill quite rapidly. Now she didn't speak to her director because She didn't feel psychologically safe. She didn't feel comfortable with being vulnerable about what was going on with her. And she'd also internalized a lot of the anxiety as there's something wrong with me. I'm not being strong enough. I'm not being resilient enough. She'd she'd wrapped quite a lot of shame and embarrassment about the anxiety and internalized it, which is very, very, very common. And she had actually reached out to her private medical um, company to get help, but she was on a waiting list of six months. And she reached the point where, again, a lot of people reach where it was kind of crisis point. And she actually went to the doctor and she was signed off work for three months. Now, three months for most employees is is an impact on an organization, but particularly in a role that holds so much responsibility, it was a significant impact for the business. Now, she reached out to me and Um, started working with me privately, which is something that she paid for out of her own pocket. And what I found really interesting to observe was this relationship that she had with her manager. Now, I'm delighted to say that through working together, she's overcome the anxiety. She's now back at work. But it occurred to me if her manager had had a conversation with her much sooner then potentially they could have avoided her being off work. They could have explored some other solutions that were able to mean that she was getting the help, whether that was through the private medical or through, through some other avenues and that they wouldn't have had the impact that they'd had. So thinking about that big picture perspective, what's going to be the impact of your management mental health, well, it is going to be things like retaining your top talent. It is going to be things like employee engagement. It is that absolute link between high performance and well-being. So I was having a conversation with a chief exec last week um, about this topic, and he was saying, you know, a lot of our goals are very financially based, which for a lot of organizations, their goals are going to be financially based. So looking at where management mental health training fits into that is exactly this. If we want to make more money as an organization, I know some of you are charities, 
But if we want to make more money, then we need people to be at work and we need them to be at work well. And if they're well, they're going to be performing. So thinking about what it is that we're trying to achieve with management mental health training. Yes, it's about spotting the signs. Yes, it's about giving managers the skills and the knowledge for how to tackle these conversations. But it's also thinking about things at that big picture level, how that's going to feed into employee engagement, how it's going to feed into talent, how it's going to feed into, you know, say, for example, you've got a goal to have the best employee net promoter score within your industry, which is a very simple way of measuring whether people would recommend this as a place to work, then management mental health training is one of those things that again, will feed into that because we're teaching managers how to really connect with people, how to send out the right signs and signals that they really do care, that they're valued that they matter, that we're a people first culture. Does that make sense? Has anybody got any questions about that? And I think one of the reasons that I stress that it's important that we also look at the big picture is that if you're in a position where you're having to produce say for example, a business case to get the financial investment for the organization to say, you know, there's the money to invest in management mental health training, then we need to be able to show the C-suite, we need to be able to show the board of directors, whoever's gonna sign this off is what the business case is. And it's not always going to be about just reducing absence you know I've worked with a lot of organizations where absence isn't necessarily an issue presenteeism is probably more of an issue than absence is so it's not always about the absence but again it is about thinking about that bigger picture perspective that if we've got employees that feel that they're valued if we've got a culture where people feel psychologically safe if we have got managers that are initiating conversations with people that can help to feed into that prevention over cure approach, then we've got a far better chance of being able to put together a business case where we can measure that return on investment. Does that make sense? Agnes, sorry for technical problems. Don't worry about technical problems. We're used to technical problems. I'll be happy to hear new information. We're about to develop a well-being policy or strategy, and mental health is an important part of it. Absolutely, it's an important part of it, Agnes. Um, so absolutely, starting with the end in mind, thinking about what it is that you're trying to achieve at that big picture level. And one of the questions that... I would invite you to ask yourself, which can sometimes help us get out of our head and thinking about the big picture, is one where I ask, and I ask this whether it's management mental health training, whether it's a wellbeing strategy, whether it's a series of webinars, is if we were having a conversation, say six months from now, having delivered management mental health training, what would you be telling me that has changed? What would you be describing to me that you were seeing, that you were hearing, that you were experiencing, that let you know that the training had been worthwhile? So one of the examples of this is from a company who we ran training for, gosh, a couple of years ago now, called Sophology. If you're UK based, I'm sure that you've heard of Sophology. They're a furniture retail organization. And we ran training for about 200 of their managers on management mental health training. And at the end of that training, I met with the head of HR and said, what are you seeing? What is it that you're hearing that lets you know that this training has been successful? And one of the things that they described is Psychology have 
numerous locations all across the UK and Ireland. And they said that as a result of the training, the stores, and these were their words, not mine, the stores are buzzing. They're buzzing with the training that managers have now got a universal language for how to describe mental health, that they feel so much more comfortable in recognizing that mental health isn't something that managers have to find a solution for, that they really understand their role and their responsibility when it comes to management mental health. Because previously, what they'd experienced is a lot of managers who were managing mental health within the workplace felt that they had to somehow come up with a, a solution. So if somebody said that they were struggling with stress or depression, or even though even just something that they were experiencing, which are the kind of things that we all experience, which is what we can just say is life. You know, maybe they've got um, a parent that's just been diagnosed with dementia. Maybe they've got something going on in their personal life that's impacting them to do with one of their children. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe they're going through any of the kind of things that we experience in life. So it doesn't mean that they are necessarily labeled with a condition like stress or anxiety or depression, but they're just struggling to cope. That managers were able to realize that they didn't have to come up with the solution, but that their role was to initiate these conversations and to be able to guide people in where to get help. So they really felt that they had this universal language, they had this universal understanding of how to approach it. And actually one of the things that they weren't expecting, but which was a beautiful um, bonus to the training is that a lot of the managers, because of the nature of the business and because they were all located in these different areas, had never actually met each other. So you might have one store in Edinburgh and you might have another store in Milton Keynes and they might have heard the name of these people, but they never actually met. So in coming together and it was kind of lockdown time, so we did the training online. So in coming together and sharing their experiences of managing mental health and what they were struggling with, it actually created a lot more cohesive working relationships with the managers and it helped the managers to see that they weren't alone, that they weren't the only people that were struggling to, to deal with this topic. So it really helped to foster better working relationships and more cohesive working. So thinking about what is it that you really would love that um, to tell me or whoever it is that you work with has changed. So moving on from that, how much of the mental health spectrum do you cover? Well, the mental health spectrum is a really vast spectrum. You've got anything that is putting what I would say most people are in, are in the stress response. In fact, about 70% of people are living in the stress response. Whether they recognize that or not is a different matter. So we've got stress, we've got burnout, we've got anxiety, and within, in, oh, within anxiety, we've got all the different anxiety-based disorders like generalized anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress, um, we've got depression, we've got bipolar, we've got addiction. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got more severe cases, as you might describe them, like psychosis, um, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder. So one of the things that HR professionals are actually a lot um, unsure about is how much of that spectrum they should cover within management mental health training. Now, whilst I would say that there's no wrong answer and there's no right answer to this, 
from my experience, from my point of view, is what we don't want to do with managers is we don't want to overwhelm them. One of the biggest reasons that managers struggle to manage mental health in the workplace and why they often um, avoid managing it is because of fear. The fear of making things worse, the fear of saying the wrong thing, the fear that what's going to happen, what if I don't know what to say, so they cannot actually end up avoiding it rather than doing something about it. So the last thing that we want to do with managers is to overwhelm them. This is a brand new topic for, I would say, the vast majority of managers. So what I would invite you to do is to actually look at your HR data and see what are the key themes if you do um, have HR data, which I think most organizations do, although I am aware that some organizations don't have this data, but what are the key themes of things that you can see that people are struggling with? What is it that your mental health first aiders have identified if you have MHFAs? What are the key themes? Now, MHA, MHFAs, they're not going to be able to give you any confidential information, but if you do use them, they might be able to say, you know what, we're really seeing people struggling with burnout at the moment, for example. Um, but looking at what data that you do have that can help you to decide how much of that spectrum to cover. It's my point of view that we don't need to cover all of it. In cases where we've got things like schizophrenia or psychosis or multiple personality disorder, it's my experience that those cases are more few and far between. And what's more common is things like stress and burnout, anxiety and depression. So that's what we tend to cover as part of our management mental health training. But it can be that an organization does have more specific needs. So for example, I did some work with the British Council probably about seven or eight years ago, and they'd actually had a number of cases with people that were struggling with bipolar. So it was important for us to include bipolar as part of the management mental health training. Um, I had a conversation not that long ago with Tesla. Now Tesla, one of their manufacturing units um, in Arizona, was an area which people were really struggling with addiction. It was um, an area of the country where poverty levels were quite high, standard of living was quite low. And so they had some real challenges with addiction, with alcoholism. And so again, for that organization, it was important that we spent a lot longer covering things like addiction. And, and again, these are really big topics. I mean, the topic of addiction, I could spend, I could spend a week on that alone. So it's speaking to organizations on that one-to-one -one level to understand, well, what is it that managers really need? They don't need a PhD in this. They're not, this training isn't about turning them into therapists. It's not about them becoming counselors or anything. It's what is it that they need to know? What is it that they need to have in order to manage these topics in terms of the depth of them? So when it comes to the spectrum from, oh, I think we've lost a couple of people I'm guessing from technical issues. Um, when it comes to the spectrum, for example, Rachel, what would you say from your experience have been the kind of key themes that you can see going on within your organisation? Sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Ah, sorry. Um, so, so stress and depression and anxiety, I think, are the three key areas that 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 we have when and potentially at some sort of not not the extreme, but some sometimes towards burnout as well. Yeah, and I would say that that's very common. Um, 
within most organizations. So it's my suggestion that for organizations, especially if this is the first time that you're looking at rolling out any kind of management mental health training, is to look at what are the most common things that you're seeing within the organization and to focus in on that. And you know, some organizations that we've had that have reached out to us have really tragically and sadly had people that have taken their own life. And so they've wanted something around suicide prevention. What do we do in a crisis? Now, again, from my experience, I wouldn't advise trying to squash anything around suicide prevention into management mental health training at the same time. I think that would just completely overwhelm managers. I think when it comes to management mental health training, yes, being able to spot the red flags is important, but where I've observed managers getting the most impact from training is being able to take that step back and being able to understand what's taken somebody from being okay to not being okay. And that involves understanding more about the human mind, understanding about the impact that our thinking has, understanding the link between the mind and the body. So again, if I draw on psychology as a great example, they had quite a high level of physical health conditions. So things like migraines, upset stomachs, flu, you know, all the things that I'm sure that we're aware of in most organizations and having just uh, come through COVID, I totally understand that, that people, we're not robots, we are going to get sick from time to time. But what was really enlightening for um, sophology is understanding that link between physical health and mental health. So for example, if we are living in the stress response, we're effectively living in survival mode. And so in survival mode, the body doesn't have its normal healing capacity. So without delving too much into the neuroscience of stress, but about 70% of our immunity is actually held in our gut. So even though it might look like somebody has migraines or they've got something going on with their digestive system or they're experiencing lots of um, colds and flu, it could be an indicator that they're actually experiencing stress. And so the physical health conditions are a, an indicator that somebody is struggling at that mental level because mental and physical health absolutely go hand in hand. So understanding that gave things a real different perspective for managers at Sophology and within all of the organizations that we've delivered training for. But what I've observed as well in helping to take that step back and look at the human psyche, look at cause and effect, has had a remarkable impact on destigmatizing mental health. Because although there's been so much more of a spotlight on mental health in the last, I would say, five to 10 years, there is still a lot of stigma that's attached to it. And stigma that often people, if they're struggling, a bit like the example I gave of the lady that I was working with, that stigma is often um, self-perpetuated. You know, they feel like they should be performing, they should be doing better. And I've lost count of the amount of people that I've worked with over the years who are struggling in whatever way, shape or form. And when I've explained what's really going on at a neurological level and a physical, physiological level, it's been like a sigh of relief because they say, oh, it's not, it's not me. It's not me personally. And I'm like, no, it's not you personally. This is what's happening in your brain. This is what's happening in your body. This is anxiety, stress, depression are a byproduct of what's really happening. And they often say, so I'm not the only person that feels like this. And I'm like, absolutely not. 
You know, we know the statistics in the UK that one in four people is experiencing a struggle with their mental health at any one time. In the US, it's one in five people. But it's amazing that people um, feel very isolated and often feel like they're the only ones that are experiencing what it is that they're experiencing, which for me is even more crucial to why we need to invest in management mental health training because one organization that I worked with, the managing director himself actually had to take uh, two, two or three months out of the business for stress and anxiety. And when he came back, one of the things that they did as part of their launch of a new well-being strategy is he actually created a video where he talked about his personal experience and the impact that it had on him and that was so so powerful he had people that were coming up to him and saying I felt a little bit like that you know it really created a sense of psychological safety it really helped to change how mental health was perceived within the organization. So coming back, where am I? Now, tools, 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 tools. So once you've identified how much of the spectrum that you want to cover, one of the things that I hear from HR leaders um, or managers themselves is we need tools. We need tools to be able to manage mental health. And I asked the question, what, what would a good tool look like? Because the truth is that managers already have the three key tools that they need to be able to manage mental health effectively. Those tools are the ability to connect with another human being, the ability to empathize, and the ability to listen deeply. Those are the absolute key three tools that people need. If we have the ability to really connect with somebody, to connect at a heart level, to be able to show that we are present, that we're engaged, that we're listening, then even if we don't quite say the right thing or something comes out and it maybe doesn't come out in quite the right way, if people have got a connection with somebody, then if they do say something that's not quite right, it's not gonna hang around because that feeling of connection within the, another human being is really what we're looking for. <coughs> and that ability to empathize, to be able to step into that other person's world, to be able to calibrate with them is so, so powerful. Now there is a difference between sympathy and empathy. We do go into that in our management mental health training but the ability to listen. And I would say that the ability to listen is one which from all the management mental health training that we've done has had the most feedback because at the start of the training, most managers would say that they're good listeners. <laughs> I think most of us like to think that we're good listeners, but we put them through our listening exercises and as a result of that, they realize that they're actually not very good listeners. Um, they recognize that when somebody shares something with them and it's uncomfortable or that we can see that that person's struggling, that they're in pain, then they have a natural tendency to want to jump in and try and resolve the problem. I often have um, organizations say, you know, we're just natural problem solvers. And it's like, well, we're not looking for you to resolve the problem because you're not a mental health expert. But that ability to just listen to somebody. And by listening, we don't mean that you have to sit there for hours with somebody, but 
What we don't want managers to do is we don't want to be having them jump in and start trying to offer advice or to cut off the conversation too quickly. I know one example is um, an organisation that I worked with a couple of years ago now. I worked with the um, C-suite of um, a team of solicitors. Now, it was, again, just around the kind of um, lockdown time. And one of the directors spoke about the fact that he was quite nervous about coming back to work in the office. Um, and actually, he would have preferred to have continued to work at home. Now, if I'd been his manager, I might have had the tendency, if I didn't know this, I might have had the tendency to assume what he was talking about, to try and jump in and go, oh, you know what? I think we all feel a little bit like that, but it'll be fine. You know, once you get used to working in the office again, you'll be okay. But because I absolutely understand the need to listen, I listened to him and I said, what is it that's making you feel a bit anxious about coming in to work at the office? And actually what transpired is that his wife had tried to take her own life several times and he was terrified of what would happen if he came into the office, what we, he would potentially find when he got back home. And it was a beautiful example of what we can really gain from what that other person needs when we listen. And again, it's through that ability to really listen that we can really connect. We can hear what's being said and what's not being said. And where I've seen this um, ability to listen be the gift that keeps on giving is where managers have recognized that they've not really been listening and then start to put into practice what we teach them about listening is the difference that it makes in all areas of their work. So, so many of them, we've worked with a lot of organizations that are digital marketing companies, so they work with a lot of clients and they really started to listen to what their clients needed instead of jumping in too soon um, assuming what it is that they needed. They started to even listen to their children at a much deeper level. They started to listen with their partners at a much deeper less, uh, level. In fact, one, <laughs> one manager said, he said, I think this might have actually saved my marriage. He said, because I hadn't realized that I've never really been listening to my wife. But he started to put into practice what we were teaching about listening. She started to get a little bit suspect at the beginning because she's like, oh, you never normally listen to me. But I know myself from having worked with so many people at a one-to-one -one level, the power of what it is to just be heard, to be heard, to be listened to. And once we're able to really listen, then we can make suggestions about where people can potentially get help. Other tools which I think absolutely complement this is things like coaching skills. So one of the things that we weave into our management mental health training is something called solution focused coaching. So when it comes to problem solving, what I observe is there's a lot of focus on the problem. And I would say this applies to anything, but the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, well, the problem is, is if we're focusing on what the problem is, we can find ourselves going round and round in circles for a really long time and not actually getting anywhere. But in using solution focused coaching, what we do is we teach our managers um, some very simple but very powerful solution focused coaching questions that they can ask that steer people away from what the problem is into what the solution is. Now that can be something as simple as what would really help you right now? You know, what is it that you need from me? One of the things that I hear managers struggle a lot with is I don't have time to be having really in-depth conversations with a lot of people. 
And that's where they see the value of solution focused coaching because they are spending a lot of time on the problem instead of asking some very simple but powerful questions that can cut through a lot of that detail and help to make people part of the solution. By engaging with them in those kind of questions, it gets somebody's brain firing and wiring in new ways that help them to think actually what would be helpful right now? What would make a real difference? So as far as, you know, how many tools do you need to give people? Well, again, from an HR perspective is thinking about what management development training of people already have. If they've already had a lot of training on emotional intelligence, on listening skills, then maybe you don't need to go into that amount of amount of depth on your management mental health training. But equally, if they've had very little to nothing, then that's something I absolutely encourage you um, to cover within your training. Now, as far as your metrics go, as far as your ability to manage, um, not manage, to measure the training. I'm guessing that when it comes to identifying what's working and not what's not working within your organization, um, that you already have metrics in place. Agnes, Rachel, is that the case? Do you have particular metrics that you measure every month that lets you know where you are? Oh, I can't hear you. If you're having technical issues, you can just pop it into the chat function. Okay, I'm guessing there's some technical issues going on. So when it comes to measuring the impact of management mental health training, again, HR leaders sometimes wonder, you know, is the management mental health training going to reduce absence? Is it going to improve um, retention? Is it going to improve employee engagement? And I would say, yes, if it's done well, that it's going to impact all of those things. But rather than manage the, uh, rather than many, oh, can't get my words out, rather than measure the management mental health training as a one-off, is in the same way that if you think about sales, an organization that has got its sales data, they look at what the sales data is doing every single week, every month in order to drive the sales, but they're also looking at the quantitative side of things. So Rachel's saying things like retention rates, yep, yeah, working days lost. So where you've already got your, measure, your measurements around your HR data, around um, employee engagement, is if you're delivering management mental health training for the very, very, very first time, and managers have never experienced anything like this before, then would I expect to see an impact on things like absence, um, yeah, of course. You know, if managers feel more comfortable, more competent in initiating conversations that can potentially um, prevent people from being off in the first place, from steering them towards the resources that they need, of course, we're gonna to expect to see that correlation. But again, I would invite you to go back to managing things um, to measuring things on a bigger picture perspective, because I'm also willing to guess that mental health training for managers isn't going to just be the only thing that you're doing to meet those metrics, to drive those metrics. 
It's a little bit like um, Agnes is saying, if you're developing a well-being policy, then with it, when it comes to um, a well-being strategy, one of the things that I say with organizations is you don't want to go out with everything at the same time because you won't be able to know what's made the difference and what hasn't. So if you were to go out with employee webinars and you were to go out with some new policies, if you were to go out with some um, management mental health training, if you were to go out with some um, appraisal training, any number of things in one hit, then we're not really going to be able to identify what's had the biggest impact. So when it comes to delivering this, it's again, it's also thinking about what's going to be the long term benefit. So if managers um, are learning to create a greater sense of psychological safety as a result of the training that that's had and they maintain that, then you're going to be able to measure that with your employee engagement survey, for example. So it's again, it's thinking about the big picture and how you can measure the return on investment on that on a longer term vision. So I'm conscious that we've come to the end of our time together. So I'd love to just spend the last couple of moments, um, the last couple of minutes just inviting anybody if you've got any questions or what is it that you've heard today that's really landed with you? And you can pop that into the chat function if you are having some technical issues. Rachel, I can see your microphones. You've unmuted yourself, but I can't unfortunately hear you. The idea of creating psychological safety. <laughs> I think I might have to run this session again. I think there's a lot of uh, technical issues going on for people. <laughs> yeah, psychological safety is is such a it's such a big one, and for me, from my personal point of view, it just feeds so much into culture. And that's why I say that management mental health training isn't just about being able to spot the signs and it's not just about being able to have conversations. It's about what that gives us at a much greater level. So if people feel safe, you know, bearing in mind the relationship that they have with their manager is so critical that if they feel comfortable, if they feel safe, um, either speaking to their manager or their manager speaking to them and them feeling safe to be vulnerable, that has a huge ripple effect on an organization's culture without question. Agnes, have you got any questions that you would like to ask? Okay, well, I hope that that has proved to give you some insights, to give you some food for thought. If you have got anything that you would like to ask, anything that I haven't covered, then do feel free to get in touch with me. Um, and if you would like to have a one-to-one -one consultation about management mental health training within your organization, where we can dive a little bit deeper into what your organization needs, what your managers need, then please do reach out to us. But thank you very much for your time. And yes, Agnes, you can get a session of the recording. I think actually what I'm tempted to do 
is because we had, I don't think you would have heard, but because we had about 18 people that were due to attend today's session. And what I always find really beneficial with any of these sessions is the interaction with other people, you know, to be able to talk about what people are struggling with. I think there's a huge value of that. So I'm happy to send you the recording, but um, I think I might actually look at rerunning this as well so that we can see if we can get more people live. So you'd be very welcome to rejoin us on any future sessions that I run. But thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, <coughs> thank you for uh, dealing with my croaky voice. Bye-bye <laughs> for now.